We're used to dress codes, either uh, written or um, assumed, for formal occasions anyway, perhaps something like a wedding or a, a funeral. But in most of life, including for church services, the trend is towards everything being very informal and comfortable, no rules. And the other trend in clothing in recent years has been to reduce the differences between men and women. Uh, Trousers and jackets are worn by women. Uh, Men are wearing colours and styles that I think their (laughs) grandfathers and great-grandfathers would not have touched. Paul here gives rules for what must be worn in church. And he's not afraid to distinguish between men and women. It is, of course, written to a congregation in a Greek city in Rome 2,000 years ago, or in the Roman Empire. And as we look at it, if you're like me, I think you find yourself thinking, I'm not even sure what Paul was wanting them to do, let alone how we apply it to us. But all scripture is God-breathed. Let me first of all uh, explain what I think this was about how it was meant to impact uh, those Christians in Corinth as they heard about it. Primarily, looking at, say, verse 5, it is about women in church with uncovered heads. The word for covering that's used in this passage probably means a shawl or a scarf. Uh, In some of our translations, there's the word veil, but we're not talking about a veil over the face. Uh, A a shawl or a scarf, not really a hat. Um, And it's about what is worn in the church or in the congregation. So, for example, verse 16 uh, talks about the churches. Really, the word is the congregations. And actually, this is the start of several chapters in this letter uh, that are all about the gatherings, the meetings, the congregations. And it seems, from what I've read, that it was normal for first century Greek or or Roman um, married women to wear a head covering in public. It was a sign of being under the headship of her husband, a sign of being part of his household. And of course, nearly all women at that time over a certain age were married uh, or were widows. And if they were widows, they would continue to dress like the married women. So pretty much all women over a certain age, and it would probably be quite a young age, sound young to us, maybe 15, 16, Uh, all of those women would wear head coverings in public. So I think what we need to get is Paul is not commanding them to put on something strange when they go to church. It's not a command for women to wear hats in church, unless hats are the normal public dress of a married woman. Um, I hope Bill won't mind me quoting him. He was telling me on Friday how when he and Dorian were young, they would uh, travel to church uh, on the motorbike, and uh, wearing their helmets, of course, and Dory would have to have her hat in a bag that she was carrying. Uh, I said to him, why didn't, why didn't she just wear the, the helmet? Wouldn't that be a head covering? Uh, apparently that wouldn't have, wouldn't have really done, but there we are. Some of us uh, are aware that that was very much the culture, but I don't see how this can really be about putting on something when you arrive at church that you wouldn't normally wear. The word for woman, gynae, uh, means either woman or wife. So you need, to, you need to recognize wherever we've got the word woman here, the translators have decided to, to use the word woman, but they might e- equally have decided that it should be wife, according to the context. So verse 5 could be every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. One more thing just to clear up, looking at verse 14 and 15, I don't think it's about long hair. Some people have said, because verse 14 and 15 is about hair length, some have said that actually this is the covering that's being discussed in the whole passage. But uh, I can see the argument, but when you look at verse 6, for example, it doesn't seem to me to really work. If the covering is the hair, and then Paul says if a woman doesn't cover her head, presumably meaning she doesn't have long hair, then she should have her hair cut off. That doesn't actually make sense. Unless we're talking about women putting their long hair up, so they still have the long hair, but they're not covering their head with it. It's a possibility, but I'm not really convinced. 
I think he's actually talking about hair being the covering that God has given, but he's also talking about another covering that is worn. Notice as well, verse 5, it's not a command concerning the whole of the church meeting. It's not about what you wear to church. It's specifically about women who are praying or prophesying. So praying could mean perhaps leading intercessions or other prayers. It could mean some uh, work of the Spirit that leads a woman to, to pray, a sort of direct revelation. Prophesying certainly means declaring God's words with his authority. Not necessarily predicting the future, but forthtelling rather than foretelling uh, of God's word. I think, as I've said before, that was uh, a gift particularly for the apostolic age. Uh, while the New Testament scripture was still being written and was not available um, to all. But we could discuss that. So I think what Paul is countering here is that certain women in Corinth are removing their head coverings, which they normally wore, in order to get up and speak to the congregation, to prophesy or to lead in prayer. Maybe, and this is a bit of guesswork really, but perhaps a belief that since God has poured out his spirit on both men and women, uh, that's the prophecy from Joel 2 that gets quoted by Peter on the day of Pentecost in Acts 2. Since God has done that, maybe they thought it's not appropriate for the women to speak as one under the authority of a husband wearing, uh, wearing the head covering. She could or she should speak as one who's directly under the authority of the Lord in the service of the Holy Spirit without a covering. I don't know. Maybe that's what they were thinking. Or perhaps a belief that in Jesus, the distinction between male and female is now coming to an end and that therefore... Uh, they need to push against that. From what Paul says in verse 16, uh, it's clear that some are being contentious about this. They are arguing, they're quarreling about it. You remember Paul was in Corinth for 18 months. Uh, he was teaching them, he was helping these new Christians to grow and to understand God's word and teaching them how they were to live and how they were to behave. So it seems like after he's left, uh, when he left, the pattern, I think, would have been that the women continue to wear the head coverings. After he's left, some are now making an issue of this, wanting to force a change, rejecting the head covering for women and what it stands for. And so Paul is saying very clearly and very firmly that the women should not remove their head covering in order to pray or prophesy, because this dishonors their husband. We'll see how that works in a minute. Even if I'm right about all of that, and I hope that begins to make a bit of sense of the passage, we're still left uh, perhaps a little bit of wondering why Paul would feel the need to command this of the Corinthians, and maybe a lot of wondering about what purpose the Holy Spirit had in making sure this was in our Bibles. What is this here for, for us? What does the passage tell us to do? Without getting entangled in all the details of the head coverings, let me sum it up like this. I think it's saying to us, God is saying to us through this, we need to glory in God's glorious design for men and women. That's what they need to do, and that's what we need to do as well. Let's dive in a bit and think about a few things. First of all, very, very simply, men and women are different. That's all over this passage. Uh, let me read you two verses, verse 4 and 5. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. Paul speaks separately about men and women right through the passage. He doesn't say people, he doesn't say human beings. He, he's unable to lump them all together like that because there are different things to be said, different instructions to give. And although, for example, verse 12, there are sentences emphasizing that both men and women are equally significant and which call for humility, particularly from the men, there are plenty of verses here that make clear that we are different. We are, of course, closely related. We're all humans. Uh, we're all men, as the Bible would put it. And yet we're different, men and women, by design, by God's design, by God's good 
design. And the difference is there, actually right through scripture, very prominently, right from the first mention of the creation of mankind. So Genesis 1, 26, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, over the livestock, over all the earth, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. Both male and female, made in God's image, made to rule over creation, and yet there's no hiding the differences. They are part of God's plan. Our culture has been trying to steadily erase or forget the differences. In our culture now, there's that preference for words like human being or people, rather than saying men and women. There's that growing preference for unisex clothes and hairstyles and uniforms and even toilets. There's that embarrassment about boys and girls' colours or boys and girls' school uniforms or boys and girls' toys or subjects that they might be more interested in. There is, of course, that pushback against single-sex schools or youth organisations or clubs or sports. And, and the more extreme stuff recently, the maternity units that are told they can't refer to women, or the teachers that are told don't say boys and girls, just say children, uh, and so on. I think we are in a pretty much a full-blown rebellion against our creator, which means we don't trust him. We don't like what he's made. We reject his design of male and female. We want to erase it or diminish it or destroy that difference. Because to us as a culture, speaking generally, it seems oppressive and unnecessary, rather than good and essential to our blessing. Homosexuality and transgenderism are more recent attacks, well, they've grown more recently, uh, attacks on God's design of men and women. I think even churches have become embarrassed by God's design. We, we abandon the early chapters of Genesis very easily. We're embarrassed to talk about masculinity or feminine, femininity. We, we look at a passage like this and think, oh, good grief, is that coming up on Sunday? You know, we, we've fallen into that trap of thinking there's something a little bit substandard about certain parts of what God has done. Churches promote feminism and the feminization of the church, and we start to lose any sense of what men might be for in God's design. Some Christians claim to be Bible-believing Christians, and yet they really have tried to explain away passages like this, and have done the same with uh, 1 Corinthians 14, which is coming up in a few weeks, 1 Timothy 2, where, women, uh, where it says women must not teach or have authority, over men, they should remain silent in the churches. Many of these people would say they're evangelicals, they're Bible-believing Christians. Um, they would deploy all kinds of clever arguments to avoid the plain meaning of the passage, saying the Greek words could mean something else, or Paul is actually quoting his opponents, Paul doesn't really believe these things. Uh, I've heard that uh, I've heard people say, "Well, actually, it's addressed to a particular problem in that culture, and it just applies to that time and not not universally, and so on." I think my question to them is this: When you reinterpret the passages as you do, do you end up with any distinction between men and women in how they are to live, in how they are to, in what they? can or can't or should do in the life of the family or in the life of the church. If you end up removing all practical difference in what men and women are or how they should live, then it seems to me you've left behind the Bible. Because passages like this are unashamedly full of teaching that applies to men and not to women and teaching that applies to women and not to men. Men and women are different. Secondly, Picking up two phrases in this uh, passage. The head of the woman is man, and woman is the glory of man. 
Paul gives two reasons for the head coverings. The first of them is headship. So verse 3, verse 3 says that the head of the woman is man, but you notice that statement comes in a list of relationships that all need to be considered together. Verse 3, I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Quite clearly, he's not talking about inferiority. Christ is not inferior to God the Father. He voluntarily submits himself to his Father's will and plan. That's why he goes to the cross for you and for me. Paul says the man who covers his head dishonors his head. And I think by that second head, it must mean Christ. Christ is his head. He dishonors Christ if he covers his head because Christ died to save him, to take away his sins. He ought to stand uncovered in God's presence without shame or fear. But Paul applies it differently to the women. The, women who, the woman who uncovers her head, he says, dishonors her head, that is, her husband. That's who he's just said is her head. Though, of course, she's also saved by Christ, therefore she is able to stand in, in the Lord's presence without fear and shame. Yet Paul says it's more important that she covers her head as a sign of being under her husband's authority. To reject that is to dishonor her husband, her head. Some people have said the word head uh, just means source, you know, like the head of a river. But wherever else that word is used, it always seems to mean authority. Not a self-centered use of authority, but leadership that serves the one that you're head over. So the father is the head of the son, who he loves. And Christ is the head of every believer, loving us and giving up his life for us. And as Paul says to the Ephesians, husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That is what it means for Christ to be the head or the husband to be the head of the wife. That's why in the marriage service, the father hands his daughter to the protection and care of her new husband. So headship is one reason for the covering, and the second one is glory, looking at verse 7. A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. We've just read, of course, from Genesis, both men and women are made in the image of God. That's true, to his glory. But there's also a chain of glory, just as there was a chain of headship. The man is the glory of God, shining forth from God. The wife is created by God to be the glory of her husband. I mean, just look at a couple on their wedding day. It's obvious who the glorious one is, isn't it? And we shouldn't be embarrassed or ashamed about that. What is emphasized on the wedding day is true always. She shines forth from the man as he lays down his life for her and so gives to her greater holiness and radiance. That's the teaching of Ephesians 5. Notice Paul is not saying these things just because he's trapped in first century culture and doesn't understand or can't operate outside of that. His argument is timeless because his argument comes from creation, how God made things at the beginning, and the order in which God made the first man and the first woman. Verse 9, for man did not come from, sorry, verse 8, for man did not come from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. Referencing, of course, Genesis chapter 2, God made man first and then the first woman from the rib of the man. She is the glory of man. God gave the first man the task of having dominion over creation and bringing it to maturity. And then he made the first woman for the man to be the companion and the partner that he needed in that task. So God made him to be the head within his marriage, 
He must not abdicate that responsibility and she must not usurp his authority. For men and for women, true fulfillment and true blessing comes from accepting who God has made us to be and the role he's given us instead of fighting against God and his plan. The head of the woman is man and woman is the glory of man. And so let me sum up what we must do. Whatever the details of clothing or anything else, we must glory in God's glorious design for men and women. Have a look at verse 11. In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him, but that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? for long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, and nor do the churches of God. What are we going to do about the central command in this passage, that is for a woman to have on her head when she prays or prophesies in church a sign of being under the authority of her husband? I am honestly not sure. Our culture no longer has a head covering worn by married women or any other symbol of headship in marriage. Uh, I mean, to put on a hat or a scarf that you don't normally wear and that doesn't symbolize the authority of your husband, that doesn't seem to me to be obedience to Paul's command. So I don't know what we do about that. But I do think we have to start with the heart Let me ask you this. Do you glory in God's glorious design for men and women, the complementary nature of men and women, the headship of the husband and the command to him to love his wife as Christ loves the church and the willing submission of the wife to her husband and to his sacrificial love? Do you glory in all that? Do you think it's a good thing? Or are you battling against it? Or do you groan when you hear a passage like this? Or can you rejoice in it? I think that's the central heart issue that we need to think about. For example, verse 14, which, where Paul talks about hair length. And I, I think he speaks about it because it's the parallel. The scarf is like the long hair that God has given to the woman. What he says is that nature teaches, that even without scripture, he says, we know this. We know that long hair is a disgrace to a man. And we know that it is the glory of the woman. It's, it's obvious to us. Long hair on a man is the appropriation of what properly belongs to the woman. It's, well, whatever the man intends by it, the nature of it teaches us it is effeminate, is sexually confused. Likewise, on a woman, short hair or shaved head is a renouncing of the glory given to a woman, a rejection of part of her femininity, a rejection of the covering associated with a husband. It is something of a homosexual tendency. And it's part of our confusion and rejection of God's plan that hair lengths and hair styles for men and women have converged. Nature teaches us that men should look like men and women like women, but we've rejected nature because nature also speaks to us of our creator. Now you might say, how long is long? And how short is short? Uh, I heard someone explain it like this. I think it's helpful. Let's not get the rulers out. But if you're uh, married, then it's good if a husband's hair is shorter than his wife's hair. Let's just start there. That would be helpful. I think the point is this. Don't diminish Don't downplay, don't be ashamed of God's design. Don't blur the differences. The differences are meant to reflect Christ and his church and the father and his son. I think 
it comes about in, in quite small ways. I don't know if you've ever been caught on this one. You're about to ask for some men to help move some heavy loads, and then you suddenly get embarrassed because you think maybe we shouldn't speak like that anymore. Or we start to think uh, that military combat roles really ought to be open to women because it's unfair just to send the men in all kinds of ways. What nature is teaching us and what ought to be obvious to us, we start to get embarrassed about and pull back from. We get brow beaten by our culture. But we, as Christians, who have the word of God and the spirit of God, we're meant to be the ones transforming the culture by the gospel so that the glory goes to God and not to us. And true blessing for us and for the church and for our nation comes from accepting who God has created us to be. So let me sum up that. What does the passage tell us to do? I am not sure about the detail. If you would like to discuss how we work this out in terms of actual practical things, then then that would be great. But we are being told to glory in God's glorious design for men and women, not to diminish it or to downplay it or to be ashamed of how God has designed things. Let's pray together.